Welcome to our next uh, Maxine Science Goes Public talk um, online. We are happy to have you here again. Every Tuesday, scientists of our, of our institute present, present something about their life and their work. Today, we have Alexander Winning with us. Thank you for being here. Alexander um, he lived as a kid already in North Carolina, Washington State, Georgia, and um, in Landstuhl, Germany. And I heard that your mom took you um, to contact to wild animals. And yes. somewhere I found something which I was I found very interesting that you say that your job job is very interdisciplinary and all what you love and I think all your hobbies are involved in that. You love tree climbing, traveling forests and working with animals. And your hobby is also be adventurer. Is that right? That's very right. I love going out and finding new things. <laughs> okay. So um, you work with kinkajous. I think that's yes. an animal that is very not very common or known in here in Germany or also in Europe. I think most anywhere, um, even even where kinkajous are common, people don't see a lot of them. Uh, so yeah, if you're watching and you don't know what a kinkajou is, you're definitely not alone. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious um, what you will tell us about um, this. I thought there were little the animals, but apparently they're smaller and little uh, and the bigger ones. And I would just um, like to say your title of the talk is how kinkajous find their food. They apparently go at night to drink from nectar full flowers. And they find fruits at the end of the branches. And but what special senses do they have to find their way at night? And I think what you also I didn't understand or get that very much. But something is that you are interested in how they move in the in the woods and the canopies on it and about the um, the 3D watching or feed human beings have. I thought it would be normal that animals have this also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll talk about three things that are some ways different and some ways different from humans, including how they move, how they sense, and how they remember things. Okay, then I think we should start, and I be, I'm happy to give over, to hand over the talk to you. And um, I would still um, like to say to our listeners, please write every question you have in our chat. And we will ask these questions after the talk to Alexander. Thank you very much and go ahead. Uh, thank you, Babette, for that introduction. And thank you to everybody who's joined to listen today and learn a little bit about kinkajous. Um, as Babette already mentioned, not a lot of people have heard of kinkajous, so I'll start by just telling you a little bit about them. Um, they're small to medium-sized mammals, on average about two to three kilograms, uh, and they're in the carnivora order. So their closest relatives include raccoons and coatis, but this is also the same order that includes dogs, cats, and bears. These critters are abundant throughout Central and South America. And if you ask me, they're very cute. And you can see uh, in this photo at this, uh, up in front of you, they've got long tongues. And this one's just sticking out a little bit to lick its nose. But they can actually stick their tongues out six whole inches, which they use to get the nectar out of the bottom of big flowers, like this balsa flower that the kinkajou you see here is holding on to. Um, so what does a kinkajou look like in action? So here I've got some video, and the first thing you might notice is it looks a little bit different. And that's because this video is a combination of infrared and thermal imaging, uh, because kinkajous are out at night, and we need these tools to see them move around. So kinkajous sleep in small holes and hollows in trees, and they get up right before dusk every night, 
um, and then they'll be in bed and they're in a hole before dawn. And so here you can see this kinkajou kind of moving his head around, looking around, or more likely sniffing around to try to find uh, balsa flowers, like the one you saw at the opening of this presentation. So kinkajous likely rely a lot on smell. And in fact, like many carnivores, they have scent glands that they use to mark their pheromones as they move around and other animals can pick up on. And they can use these to communicate about where they've been or what they're doing. Um, and if uh, you see, as he's walking around, a bright patch on his neck, that is a scent gland that's hotter and, than the other parts of his body. And that's why it shows up as whiter in these videos. So as he moves around the tree, you might notice some specialized locomotion. Kinkajous use something called a diagonal sequence gait, which means that if they were to move, say, their right hind paw, their opposite front paw, so their front left paw, would move next. And then they switch left back left, front right, back right, front left. And that kind of alternating sequence allows them to keep their balance as they're walking along these thin branches. And the only other animals to do that are primates and, mar and um, not marsupials, it's a type of marsupial, an opossum, <laughs> the uh, other arboreal mammals. So it's a special locomotive ad adaptation to moving around in trees. And here, You'll see he just stuck his face in a flower, a balsa flower there. So it's harder to see those flowers on the camera. Um, but these big flowers fill up overnight. And in fact, they fill up quite quickly, especially at the beginning of the night. So kinkajous will stay in a big balsa tree like this for several hours, moving around, finding different flowers, drinking the nectar, and even just lying down and waiting for a little bit for the flowers to fill back up so it can go back and get more. Uh, and in addition, to all of the nectar these flowers hold on to, they often attract and trap lots of bugs. So the kinkajous aren't just getting delicious nectar, they're probably getting bug soup that they get to drink up for lots of extra nutrients. You may have also noticed that this kinkajou has been alone this whole time. And in fact, kinkajous are very solitary. So they travel by themselves and they typically forage by themselves. But you'll see here, sometimes, they'll encounter other kinkajous and either try to chase them out or they may forage together. They typically sleep in small groups though. So one or two males might sleep in a tree hollow with a female and they're young. Um, and then females will either live in these small family groups or they may live entirely alone and spend most of their time in, uh, alone. So you've gotten to see a kinkajou and how it moves into this tree. Uh, and you may expect that they face uh, a lot of challenges to their foraging. So first, the canopy is very complex. There's thin lianas and vines that move around a lot when you're walking on them. It's very tangly and hard to see through. And it's three-dimensional. You have to pay attention to where you're going in all three dimensions. In addition to that, kinkajous are moving around at night uh, with very little light to see. And finally, they're looking for fruit which is often highly clustered in small, far apart patches. So they have to be able to move between these patches of fruits without spending too much time wandering aimlessly. And so they've developed a host of adaptations to solve some of these foraging challenges. And they look different depending on what we're looking at. So in response to moving around in the canopy, they've evolved many physical adaptations. In response to moving around at night, they've evolved many sensory adaptations. And what my research focuses on is what kind of cognitive adaptations they've evolved to help them find these sparsely distributed patches of fruit within the complex forest canopy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about all three of these kind of adaptations in this talk so you can get a sense of what kinkajous are like all around. So we'll start with some physical adaptations. Kinkajous have a prehensile tail which means that they can use their tail to grab onto things and hold onto things. Uh, and this is only seen in kinkajous and primates to the extent that they can really, they can fully hold on to things with their tail. They also have large claws that they can use to hold onto tree trunks um, and grip the things, the vertical surfaces that they walk up and down on. And they have grasping reversible paws. So you can see in this last picture, the hind feet are turned pretty far back. Those can actually turn 180 degrees backward 
so that kinkajous can walk forward and backward up and down branches. Uh, and their, their paws can grip things pretty tight. So they don't have opposable thumbs like primates, but they can hold things tightly with their fingers. And they also have something called a hallux, which is a little claw on their palm that looks a lot like a dew claw on a dog, if you've seen one of those. I've a lot of these physical adaptations. You may have noticed that they look a lot like primates. And this is actually a really interesting example of what we call convergent evolution, where even though kinkajous and primates are not closely related at all, they look very similar because they have adapted to similar environments in the same way, specifically moving amongst the trees and holding onto these thin branches and getting out to the end so where they can hold onto fruit and pull them close to eat them. So while we have some interesting examples of how evolution has led to similar body plans for kinkajous and primates, their senses, on the other hand, have diverged a little bit. So when we think about how kinkajous see, they have some visual adaptations that are very different from primates. One of these is called the tapetum lucidum, which is essentially a small biological mirror that sits between the retina, where uh, photoreceptors collect light so that you can see, and the choroid, which is the back of the eye where blood flows through. And if you've ever taken a flash photo of somebody and seen that red glare in their eye, that is the light reflecting off of your choroid and the blood vessels in your choroid. But if you look at uh, nocturnal animals like the kinkajou and also some of its carnivore relatives like cats and dogs, you might notice a colorful eye shine instead. And that eye shine comes from the tapetum lucidum, uh, which serves the role of reflecting light back across the retina a second time. So light comes through, it hits the retina, photoreceptors pick it up, and then when light reflects back, there's more opportunity for those photoreceptors to pick up the light. And what that represents is a trade-off that nocturnal animals often make between visual acuity, meaning the ability to see things clearly and sharply, and, vis and visual sensitivity, meaning the ability to see things at all in dim light. And it also allows animals like the kinkajou to tell things apart based on very small differences in brightness. So a kinkajou could discriminate between two things that are, to us, would look exactly the same because to the kinkajou, they're just a little bit different in how bright they are. But out in the day, they would have what we would think of as terrible vision because to them, the world likely looks very blurry. They probably can't see things very far away at all. So what do some of these adaptations look like up close? Uh, and I'm gonna play a video here from some, some folks who study kinkajous in um, French Guiana. And so you, they've got these cameras up that get videos of the kinkajous up close. So you can see them walking on the branch and you'll notice that eye shine. So the bright eyes where the tapetum lucidum is reflecting the light back off, back into the camera here. Um, and so I'll let this play. This video takes about 40 seconds. Um, and this is also a really great time while you're watching and looking at how kinkajous move around and check out this weird camera in the tree if you have any questions you want to write down. You'll notice that, yeah, he's coming to check us out and say hello. So, in addition to their visual adaptations, kinkajous also likely have adaptations to their smell. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to study this in kinkajous directly, but many carnivores, in addition to just being much more sensitive in the smells they can pick up and how they process smells, they actually have sensors toward the tips of their nostrils on both sides of their nose that allow them to detect small differences in timing of receiving scents. Uh, to determine direction, a lot like how you and I can hear where something is coming from because of differences in our right ear and our left ear. And so this may allow kinkajous to follow smells when trying to get around at night. So I've talked about physical adaptations where kinkajous look in many ways a lot like primates. They've had convergent evolution. And I've talked about some sensory adaptations where they have different adaptations to walk around at night. 
But what about how they think? What about their cognition? Um, what is that like? So on the right here, I put up some tracking data uh, where we have a, had a caller on a Kinkajou named Tony Stark that collected his GPS location every second for four hours a night over 12 nights. And what I'd like you to notice about this figure is how some of these pads are reused really frequently. And so that led us to the question, how does it know where these good pads are? And does it remember how to get between these really high value fruit patches? And if it does, how is it doing? So we have this question, how do kinkajus use spatial memory to predict where they will find fruit? And we have a couple hypotheses. So our first is what we call our null hypothesis, which is that they don't. And a null hypothesis in this case is really important because if we want to measure a behavior that we can say, says they are using spatial memory, we have to first demonstrate that their behavior cannot be explained by something like following the smell of a fruit, using tracking behavior, or even just looking randomly. For example, a kinkajou might decide that it's going to pick a random direction and go in a straight line, which could look a lot like a kinkajou that knows where it wants to go. So we have to be able to distinguish those apart. So we have this null hypothesis that we, they don't use their spatial memory to find fruit. They have other skills that they can use to do that, like their sensory adaptations. But they may also use a behavior called piloting. Um, and this is when an animal can use memory of landmarks and scenes. So maybe a really distinct tree or a rock, and it can learn behavioral responses to find food from that landmark. So if one day Kinkajou sees this big tree and goes left and finds food, it can remember next time it gets to that tree, oh, if I go left, I will find food. And by linking series of these learned behavioral responses to landmarks together, animals can develop routes that allow them to move efficiently between resources that they have found. But there's a third option, uh, an addition to piloting behavior that kinkajous may use to find their fruit. And this is what we call mapping or cognitive mapping. And in this case, the kinkajou, hypothetically, or another animal that uses this, actually builds up a representation of where important locations in to each other. And it can think about those relations separately of what it's looking at right now and the experiences it's had directly. And so it allows it to potentially infer where it might find food, even if it has never followed that path before. Um, and a nice descriptor of how this works is it's the difference between thinking, oh, I'm going to turn left at the Eiffel Tower to knowing, oh, the closest fruit to the Blue Tower is to its southeast. You get to learn about the relations between these things in your environment. So why does it matter? How can you do this? Uh, and we know quite a lot about how rat brains organize neurons and networks to allow for different forms of navigation. And we also know a lot about how, sorry, I'll, I'll, I throw this figure up. So you don't want to, you don't need to know everything that's in this figure, but this is a, a computational model from neuroscientists about how different regions of the rat brain are processing event-based memory, which is roughly translatable to this mapping system, and rule-based memories, which is roughly equivalent to this piloting system. But we don't know how we get from these neural networks and the behavior that that allows rats to use to human behavior and the way we use mapping to get around, including taking novel shortcuts, navigating around obstacles, and contextualizing our memories with the places in which they occurred. We know cognitive maps do all of these things with humans, but there's a lot more that we're not sure if cognitive maps do. So they may help us to order the sequences of our memories, understand abstract relations, develop our language skills, and generate insight across domains more than just spatial. So how did we get, how did evolution get from what we know about rat brains to the really cool mapping behaviors that humans do. And this is where looking at other animals like primates and kinkajous comes very useful. So if kinkajous brains evolved like primates, 
it would suggest convergent cognitive evolution, much like their bodies have done, uh, which tells us something about how living in the canopy and looking for fruit shapes the evolution of minds, including potentially our early primate ancestors. If, on the other hand, kinkajous don't think spatially in a way that's similar to us or to primates, it might tell us that going out at night or um, changes the way they navigate, or potentially that looking for fruits in, this, in the canopy doesn't actually affect the way your brain works all that much. So at Max Planck, we're taking two approaches to try to understand how kinkajous learn about space and navigate. Um, and the one I'm going to talk the most about is an experimental approach I developed where I went into a kinkajous home range and I set up feeding stations where I could manipulate what, if food was available on any given night. Um, and I controlled whether we site or banana at a site. And then I went to look, do the kinkajous learn where these feeding sites are? And if they do, do they learn when and what kind of foods they can find at these sites? So this research was conducted at the Barrow, Colorado Island, uh, with the Smithsonian Institute in Panama. Uh, and Barrow, Colorado Island exists in Lake Gatun, which has an interesting history. Uh, it has only been around for a short time because it was created when humans flooded the region to create the Panama Canal. So Barrow, Colorado used to be a big hilltop, but when Lake Gatun was created, it became an island. And for the last 100 years, it has become one of the most studied rainforests in the world. So it takes a lot of work to do a field experiment like this, where we put food into the canopy and look at how kinkajous are learning where it goes. So my collaborator Calixto and I had to go out and climb all the trees to build the feeding stations where the food would come up. And you can see Calixto on the bottom left, the, the stick there he's building has a pulley system on it so that once it's up, we can pull the bucket up with some food in it. And we also set up our camera trap that has taken this photo of him so that we can see the kinkajous when they come get this food. And then once our feeding stations are set up, we have to track the kinkajous to see what they're doing. Um, and this is quite the process. I can tell you that following a kinkajou around at night is very difficult. You're moving off trail. There's lots and lots of thorn bushes. I've had bullet ants on my face. Um, and the whole time you have to watch out for snakes when you're flying. But we have some cool equipment to help us. On the left, you can see our antenna that we pick up the radio signal from the collar. So basically the kinkajou is wearing a collar and it emits a beep. And this antenna allows us to pick up that signal. And by moving it around and listening carefully to the direction in which the signal is strongest, we can follow it even when we can't see it in the canopy. When we can see it in the canopy, we have our binoculars, our flashlight, and an iPad mini in which we can record all the behaviors that we see while we're following it around. Um, and you'll note on the bottom right, at, this is the first day Calixto and I tracked a kinkajou successfully. Um, and we always came back sweaty and gross, but very excited to see these kinkajous. And we both also really love working in the canopy. Uh, I think that the top of a tree is one of the most peaceful places in the world, and you get to see lots of new plants and animals you wouldn't see otherwise, and the forest from a whole new perspective. Including, and by going out at night, we also get to see lots of different animals. And I just want to take a quick moment to make an aside that one of the greatest parts about working in the rainforest is getting to see all this diversity and all this complexity. And doing the work I do where I'm trying to understand how that complexity led to the evolution of minds like primates and humans, uh, I think it's really important that we protect that because it is from that complexity and from that diversity that likely we learn to think and understand the way we do. So that, that's a small aside. Let's get back to kinkajous and how they are moving through the forest to find their fruit. Uh, when I, I went for this project, it was a pilot. We were just getting started. So we tracked one kinkajou named Molly over about three months. And this is all of the tracking data with the green shapes indicating where the feeding stations were. Um, this is cool to look at, but it's not all that helpful in answering our questions. So we can break this up into different days. So on the left is the fourth day we tracked Molly before we started putting food up at these feeding stations. 
And then on the right is night 32 of tracking Molly. And this is the last night in which we had been putting food in the same places. So um, for about three weeks, Molly was able to find food at the non-circle spots. We hadn't started putting food at the circles. And you can see she's moving pretty directly between these stations where we put up food, which is an interesting sign that she has learned how to get between these stations where we put food up. But we can look at that with the data compressed over all of our tracking nights. So in this figure, what you're looking at is each bar represents a night of tracking sequentially along the bottom. And the height of each bar is the number of feeding stations Molly visited on that night. And on the left here are the nights from before we started putting food out at the feeding stations. So even before we put this food out, she would occasionally pass by a feeding station just because it's part of the territory she lives in and she was moving past it. And then once we started putting food out, she didn't immediately become drawn to these stations. For the first two nights, she continued to apparently just pass by about the same number. But very quickly, she started visiting more stations each night until she was visiting most of the stations with food every night. So then we stopped putting food at the same stations every night and we started experimentally manipulating what kinds of food were available when they would be available and where using specific patterns. And we wanted to ask, does Molly use context about what food is available and where she has seen that food in the past to come up with new routes for traveling between these feeding stations? Um, unfortunately, with only one kinkajou, we haven't yet been able to, we don't yet have enough data to answer that question in a meaningful way. Uh, and with coronavirus, we've had to postpone the plans to go back and get more data. So hopefully soon we'll be able to look at this in a bunch of kinkajous and answer that question of how are they using context to predict both when and where they'll find food. In the meantime, we can take another approach to understanding how kinkajous and other animals are navigating through the canopy to find their food. So what you're looking at here is tracking data on the left from a kinkajou and tracking data on the right from a capuchin. And you might notice that both of them seem to have a few spots they really like to visit. And they're tightly clustered by these pink dots, which are a type of fruit tree, the dipteryx tree, that um, is very valuable to both kinkajous and capuchins during the season. But while the kinkajou on the left is using repeated routes and seems to be following the same paths, the capuchin on the right is using lots of different ways to get between. So the other thing we're working on is coming up with ways to quantify the difference between these repeated route use, which looks like piloting behavior, and paths between important locations, which may be the result of mapping behavior. So in summary, we've seen that kinkajous are excellent climbers. They have adaptations like prehensile tails and their grasping reversible paws to move up and down tree trunks. They have special sensory adaptations to move around at night, including the tapetum lucidum to help them see better in dim light and potentially uh, the ability to smell, what, smell well and detect the direction of smells. And they seem to have the ability to remember where food is located, but we don't yet know how. And determining the extent to which kinkajou's navigation using cognitive maps will help us understand how foraging for fruit in the canopy influences the evolution of animal minds, including those of our primate ancestors. So with that, I wanna thank you all for listening and also thank the sponsors of this research, the National Science Foundation, the Max Planck Institute, the Hemispheric Institute of the Americas, the Smithsonian Institute, and the University of California, Davis, as well as my collaborators who've helped me do this research. My profit, Calixo Rodriguez, Shaheen Alavi, Lucia Torres Herrera, Rasmus Havmüller, Roland Kays, Ben Hirsch, and Damian Tayo. Um, and with that, I hope I can take some questions. Hi. 
I'm here again. Thanks very much for the interesting talk. I had some technical problems, so I did hear not everything, but very much. And um, I think it was really, really nice to hear something about this very special animals. And I, there might be also a lot of questions in with listeners. I was, I, I'm not sure. How, where do you go, where do we, do we find these animals um, only in Panama or in other countries as well? Yeah, so um, kinkajus are pretty widely distributed throughout most of Central and South America. Um, so it, you'll also find them in Costa Rica, Argentina, Brazil. Okay. And um, I, I think there was something very I thought you said that you would like to understand. Maybe I am to correct me, please, Alexander. And also how evolution develops minds, the minds like we human beings have this. And the king yes. can do as I if I understand right, is like a, like the, um, we might understand via the kinkajou how this developed. Yeah, so we can start to understand the ecological factors that, that shape the evolution. Mm -hmm. So for example, living in the canopy or looking for fruit, if because kinkajous and primates share these factors, if their minds have evolved in similar ways, it suggests that these factors played a role in that evolution. And so we can start to learn about how environment shapes this kind of evolution. So we have one question here. Are the um, kinkajous consider, considered pollinators? Yes, um, and they're very important pollinators for these flowers they move between. Um, and that's another interesting, um, helpful thing we can learn from the study of how they move is also how they're going to be spreading the pollen between the plants um, and seeds. So for the balsa, it, they're collecting pollen from these flowers and moving them between the flowers. But for fruits, they're often eating the fruit and then they'll travel and poop the fruit out where it will fall to the forest floor. Um, so they're important pollinators and they're important seed dispersers for the plant species in tropical rainforests. Okay. And if so, is that um, rare for animals? So for, so, Many, I wouldn't say it's rare for animals, but it is probably pollinate, being an important pollinator is not as common for mammals. Um, and kinkajous probably play a much larger pollination role than most other mammals do. Um, but there are, there are certainly other frugivorous mammals that play really important roles as well, including primates. Okay. Is there any studies also in the group about primates, um, about pollinators being pollinated? Is um, working on that as well? Nobody in my group is studying how the primate and kinkajou movement is affecting pollination directly. Um, so, so my group is mostly focused on how they move and how they make decisions and also how the social aspects of these animals influence their movements. Um, but all we can do is um, potentially make some predictions about how those movements would affect pollination. But that's not a, a focus of the lab group I'm working in. Mm -hmm. And um, are, are these animals, are the kinkajous very shy? Or? Hmm, that's a great question. So they are not actually all that shy. Um, now, if you were to get up really close to a kinkajou, it would probably run away. And it's a little bit hard to answer that because it is not often that you are in a tree with a kinkajou that it is going to run away from you. But because they don't encounter people a lot and because they typically encounter them from up high safely in the trees, um, they don't mind people so much. And so when I'm out tracking kinkajous, um, often they will be on the branches just a meter or two above us. Um, if they feel like hanging out, 
we, they don't run away too much, but usually they're doing their own thing. So they're not in any one place long enough for that to last long. Um, but if, for example, they want to get across a branch and I'm nearby, I have seen them plenty of times take that branch not too far from me. So you don't have to be quiet when you follow them. You here. Well, really? we we could still poten potentially see. Um, I bet that following them around isn't their favorite, um, and that we may they may move around a little more when we follow them. But for the most part, no, we don't have to be quiet. Um, in fact, we tend to make a lot of noise trying to move through the rainforest underbrush at night. Um, and typically are able to keep up with the kinkajus for at least a little while. And are they curious? So would they begin to play or, or take a look for getting contact to you? Uh, I think that, so I have never tried to okay. go see if a kinkaju out in the wild would come up to me. Uh, I think that if you were in the tree with them and um, they would, they would not want to come hang out with you. Um, they are like, you know, most wild mammals, afraid of big humans, which are scary. Um, and when I say they're not all that shy, I think it mostly has to do with the fact that they are not worried about a person climbing up into the tree and getting them. Um, so I, I would say that they're, they're not going to be particularly friendly if you are in the tree with them. Alexander, you are with us, you're with Mac since Mac Crawford is your, um, um, your, I don't know how you say it in, in English, in yeah. Dr. Vater, would you say, Dr. Mutter? Yeah, my PhD advisor. Yeah. And um, you are with her since four years. Yes, that's correct. So um, you're studying since four years kinkages. Yes, for the most part. Um, the, the first part of my studies were focused mostly on being in the classroom and, and researching. Uh, and I, I just went out and I did my first work with the Kinkajus probably about three years ago. Okay. And you study them mostly in, in Panama or also in other countries? Or? For right now, just in Panama. Okay. And is there, that's just my interest, be, um, is there any animal in Europe which is hmm, of the family? No. In Europe, yes. Um, ooh, actually, mm, I feel bad. I'm, I'm not entirely certain about that. Um, so the their closest family members include raccoons, okay. um, and I'm not sure actually if there are raccoons here. Um, uh, Chris, do I don't think know? so. No, I think uh, there might be some, but um, only uh, maybe somebody's here who knows that. But um, I think uh, at least they're not. It's not a normal animal. It's what it would be somehow. Yeah. So, so I believe that their closest relatives that you would find here in Europe then would be martens, like pine martens. Okay. 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 So we have a lot of them. Yes. So that would be nice to study them also. Nobody in the Institute is studying Martins. I have actually thought about that. I think it'd be really wonderful to study Pine Martins. I think that they, um, I've heard they're pretty notoriously difficult to catch and track. So um, we'll have to see if. if... Yeah, yeah. Um, I, is there anybody who wants to ask something? So I would um, please write it now in the chat because we, I don't see any further questions. Um, Chris, do you have any more questions? Because I was really sometimes out of the system. I found very interesting what you were telling about also how they handle with memory, landmarks, mapping. I think um, you will stay for how many more time here? It's not that much, huh? Well, I should have uh, two more years here uh, okay. uh, to finish my PhD. Okay. I think it we would be really curious to hear more about this um, about this study you are do doing. It's, yeah. Chris is saying how many times to study kinkajus? How, I have how, been. How, 
how much field time you need, I think that is the mm -hmm. question. Yes, so the first time I went to Panama was just for three weeks and I was helping wrap up that project. I showed a little bit of data from at the end where um, Meg and her collaborators collected data on 49 different animals from four different species. Um, and so I was able to get to do a little bit of work with Kinkajus kind of as a helper and learning during those three weeks. And then I have since done two, three month field seasons in Panama. So most of the work I showed you today with the photos and the data from Molly and Tony Stark uh, was collected during my first three months. Okay. And the second three months, um, I was working on a separate project where the video you saw of the kinkajou in the balsa tree came from. And I was looking at how the kinkajous found individual flowers within the tree crown. Um, so, so both of those were kind of, they were what we call pilot studies, right? They were opportunities for me to get a sense of how this field work worked, if my methods were gonna work. For example, we weren't even sure that the kinkajous would find and come to these feeding stations. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I wanted to go out and just try it with one. Um, and we were really excited to see that not only did she come to them very quickly, but that it had that pause where we were like, oh, it seems like she, you know, has to find them first and learn where they are. Um, and so, yes, the, the plan was for me to go back in July to do that same study with eight kinkajous. Um, and that's been postponed, but hopefully I'll get the chance um, that that study is pl planned to take about a year um, to complete. So if you go back in, a, you don't have problems with the Corona um, time or is that? Uh... Oh, no. Yes, we do. I, I was supposed to leave in, I was supposed, or I was supposed to leave in June. Sorry. And okay. yeah, for that, for right now, that's been indefinitely postponed um, until we can, I can actually travel back there. Okay. And I, you told me before we started with the talk also that you are really very much also interested in doing outreach. And mm -hmm. I, um, if we can do again talks also, not only online or doing workshops with kids, we would yeah. be to have you there also in reality one day. Yeah, one thing that I'm really interested in and I like talking about, um, the, last, the last time I was in Panama, most of my work involved sitting in front of the same tree all night and waiting for kinkajus to show up. Um, and what I did while I was sitting there was learn a lot of the constellations. Um, and I really enjoy getting to talk about how we can use constellations as landmarks to navigate. Um, and it ties, I think that ties animals use landmarks in their own environments. Um, so I, I, maybe maybe other people don't think that's as interesting, but uh, I think that's a really fun way to get to talk about navigation and how animals think about things and also get to talk some about cool stuff in the sky. I think it's very interesting navigation because if you already start only to think, if you only ask people how they get from one point to the other one, you get 10 different descriptions, mostly from 10 different people. Huh? And it's incredible mm -hmm. also if you ask the kids, school kids, how did you arrive from school to the institute? They design, everybody does another design and mm -hmm also sees other things than than the uh, than the neighbor so yeah and if you think if you think about how you do something like get from work to home mm -hmm. it, it, what's your brain doing when you when you're doing that right it's often you don't have to pay much attention we do that basically on autopilot and that's what that piloting behavior is right when, when we say when you describe piloting animals it's that kind of automatic response to things you know and are familiar with that helps you get from place to place. Um, and so for humans, we feel like that's often like being an autopilot. Whereas when we're using these maps that reference things in our environments, that's when we have to think really actively because we have to, we have to hold on to those relations in our head and rotate them and think about how we get from one place to another. Yeah. And at the same time, what I find also strange is that um, if you get the same weight, the same thing you do every every day going to work yeah and after years you see a house you never have seen the 10 years before also passing oh, always passing the same place mm -hmm. so you change maybe also the autopilot i don't know yeah there's um definitely times when you can mix things up and especially if you run into an obstacle or you have something else to do right you can 
we can use our maps to make small adjustments and then hop over to a new route. I think that would be something really nice also to discuss with, we have a group of young people in between 12 and 21, and to discuss this, this questions, which are a little more, you can start discuss and discuss and discuss and maybe never get, come to an end. Yeah, I'd love to talk with people about that. Okay, so thank you very much for being thank you. here. And I hope to see you soonish again. And yes, me too. We, we keep in contact and um, thank you to the audience being here today. And um, I'm a little sorry, we I had really technical problems today. We have a little thunderstorm also here. And um, next time um, will be with us Andrea Flack. She will tell us about something about her science um, with storks and it's very interesting. You can also uh, find her on our homepage and we are happy if you like to subscribe our channel or visit us in Instagram or also if you like to um, subscribe our newsletter. We send out every two weeks the actual informations about the online talks or other things we do with Maxine at the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior today thank you again alexander finning to be to have, have been our guest today and have a good night everybody <laughs>